Did you know? The late Satoru Iwata wanted to make a pre-order bonus disc for Twilight Princess. Years earlier, Wind Waker racked up over half a million sales before launch, breaking the record for the most pre-ordered game ever. This was in no small part thanks to the Master Quest bonus disc, which was such a strong incentive that many fans pre-ordered just for the disc and then cancelled their pre-order. This led Nintendo to bundle the Master Quest and the Wind Waker together when it later launched in Europe. After the GameCube lost the 6th generation console war to the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, Nintendo was desperate to make the Wii a success, and with Twilight Princess as its flagship launch title, a pre-order bonus disc would have been a shrewd business move. Eight months before launch, an interviewer asked Zelda director Eiji Inuma if there would be a Wind Waker star bonus disc, to which he responded, With the size of the game, it may have to. We are currently considering adding a second disc as a bonus, but this is yet to be finalized. I think Mr. Iwasha is keen for this to happen, but we shall see. Electronic Gaming Monthly magazine announced the details. For a $10 deposit, fans would get a copy of The Wind Waker visually remade with the graphics of Twilight Princess, and with the two dungeons Miyamoto said were cut due to Wind Waker's hasty production. It sounded too good to be true, and unfortunately, it was. It was EGM's sick idea of an April Fool's prank. The unfortunate reality was Nintendo never actually got around to making a pre-order bonus. Although it's worth noting, they did release a very limited edition collector's box. This had a six-song soundtrack, high-quality 1-6 scale replicas of the Master Sword and the Hylian Shield, and a certificate of authenticity. Back then, a collector's box sold for $40, but only 7,000 were ever made, so today they've skyrocketed in value to hundreds of dollars apiece. And as it turns out, a Twilight Princess pre-order bonus disc did sort of become a reality 10 years later. This was when the HD version released on Wii U, although it was only a 20-song soundtrack. A much more impressive OST released exclusively in Japan, featuring 108 tracks, including this bonus track for Hyrule Field, which is playing right now. This was originally recorded for the Cube version, but never got used in-game. It can only be found by snooping around the internal data, but it made its way into disc 2 of the Japanese soundtrack collection. A pre-order bonus disc wasn't the only thing Nintendo wanted to give Twilight Princess fans, but couldn't. There was also a multiplayer mode. In Wind Waker, a second player can connect a GBA to take control of Tingle, who can access information, drop bombs, and sell stuff to the first player, such as blue potions and a temporary hover ability. In a 2005 interview with Spanish magazine Club Nintendo, Aonuma said, Wind Waker had GBA connectivity, but we would have to try something different that offered something different, otherwise we wouldn't be innovative. We're testing out different things, and if we find something that's fun and interesting, we'll do it. And a year later, he told EGM, Online functionality is something we've been thinking about for a long time. At this point, we've given up on having any kind of online battle mode or simultaneous play, but we are still thinking about different elements that make the game more fun for those who have their systems connected to the internet. It's my job to come up with that, and we haven't quite found what the hook should be for online play. Looking back at Zelda's history shows that Miyamoto publicly flirted with vague ideas of multiplayer as far back as the 64DD era, talking about a network Zelda where the assistance of other participants would motivate a player's actions. Presumably, those are some of the ideas Aonuma said they've been thinking about for a long time, but even though it's part of his job to incorporate online functionality, it seems he never landed on the right idea. But he did say whatever the multiplayer mode was gonna be, it wouldn't include Tingle. Not because he already had his turn in Wind Waker, but because American fans just didn't like him. And the entire point of Twilight Princess's development, above all else, was to make an American Zelda. To explain what I mean by an American Zelda, let's rewind to 2004, back when it looked like Twilight Princess might be the last Zelda. Despite being one of the most expensive series to develop, Zelda sales had been steadily on the decline ever since Ocarina of Time. Japanese players were becoming less interested in video games in general, and Wind Waker didn't sell nearly as much in America as Nintendo expected. They were originally planning on making Wind Waker 2, but the situation was so dire, they decided their best hope of saving the franchise from extinction was to cancel it and develop an American Zelda instead. As Aonuma explained it, I began to worry whether Wind Waker 2, which used a similar cel-shaded art style, was something that would actually sell. We knew what a challenge it would be to develop something that would sell in the Japanese market, where Game Adrift was happening. That's when I decided that if we didn't have an effective and immediate solution, the only thing we could do was give the healthier, North American market the Zelda they wanted. We knew that we would have to create a Zelda game that would live up to the expectations of fans in North America, and that if we didn't, it could mean the end of the franchise. 
Ocarina of Time was incredibly popular in America, so they switched the art style and initially considered making Ocarina's direct sequel. To quote Aonuma directly, it would have taken place some years later. The art department sketched Links, who looked 25 to 30 years old. But the overseas staff vetoed the designs and told them fans didn't want to play as an old Link. Nintendo of America helped pick Link's voice actor as well, choosing one that gave Link a sort of bad boy vibe. The Zelda team ultimately decided that instead of an older version of Ocarina Link, they'd use a totally different Link that was 16 or 17. And instead of a few years, it would take place a few decades after Ocarina. And because it wasn't too far in the future, some of the characters from Ocarina might still be alive in Twilight Princess. In a later interview, Aonuma made a couple of references to Navi providing feedback to the player, so it seems she was one of the characters planned to make a return. It certainly would have given the team a chance to tie up some loose ends after Navi's mysterious departure in the final moments of Ocarina. But at Miyamoto's request, Midna was created mid-development, so Wolf Link wouldn't be so boring to look at from behind. Midna then gradually became a more central character as development continued, so it seems she eventually took Navi's place as Link's navigator. It can't be said with certainty that's why Navi got axed, but it ultimately became a moot point when the Zelda team decided to push the timeline back even further. In the final build, Twilight Princess was changed to take place one century after Ocarina, so instead of appearing in the flesh, Ocarina's characters are merely referenced, like King Zora, whose grave can be found in Kakariko's graveyard, and a black and white picture of the fishing hole man kept by his descendant Hina. Although there was one character that made a return. The ancient hero who teaches you seven hidden skills is heavily implied to be Link from Ocarina of Time. Every previous Zelda game was revealed in Japan, but Twilight Princess broke precedent and was unveiled in America at E3 2004, and even the trailer itself was put together by Nintendo of America. The developers would later say the audience's enthusiastic applause cemented the direction the game would take over the next two years, and several developers said when they started feeling burnt out, they'll think back to E3's cheering applause to boost morale and continue development. According to then-Nintendo president Satoru Iwata, I think that people looking in from outside think that Nintendo Zelda team is incredibly experienced, capable of maintaining its motivation and carrying large projects through to the finish without any external input. But as it turns out, everyone on the Zelda team is only human after all. When development was finally finished, Twilight Princess launched two weeks earlier in America than it did in Japan, and was met with both critical and commercial success. Reviewers gave it an average score of about 9.6, and fans snatched it up so fast that it outsold Ocarina of Time and became the best-selling game in the series with almost 9 million copies. Ten years later, Nintendo decided to give the most successful Zelda the deluxe treatment with an HD remaster, but they were so secretive about it that Eiji Onuma couldn't even tell his own family it was being made. His 12-year-old son was too young when the original came out, so in 2015 he was suddenly inspired to dig out his Wii and play the biggest game his dad ever directed. Aonuma wanted to tell him a better version was coming soon, but he wasn't allowed. Telling the story after the game was officially announced, he said, I'm quite sad that I wasn't able to tell my son that if he waited a little bit longer he'd be able to play an HD version. But his son's misfortune was actually a blessing in disguise that gave Aonuma ideas for improvement. In the Wii version, the magic armor makes Link invincible, but eats up a ton of rupees. When his son acquired it during his playthrough, he tried it out for a few minutes, then said it was a waste of money, and never used it again. That really stuck with Aonuma, because Miyamoto hadn't wanted to include it, and Aonuma had to fight to get it in the game. So for the HD remaster, Aonuma made it so every wallet could hold more rupees, and even added a brand new colossal wallet, which increased the maximum rupees all the way up to 9,999. So now he hoped that maybe fans like his son would at least consider using the magic armor. But in Aonuma's opinion, Twilight Princess HD was still missing one very important addition. The Wii U remaster launched with the Wolf Link Amiibo, and 15 other Amiibo unlock various features in the game as well, but Aonuma says he also wanted to make a Telma Amiibo. To be honest, he seems to have some kind of weird obsession with her, and brings her up in countless interviews. As director, it's not his job to create NPCs, but for some reason he took it upon himself to get directly involved with Telma's design. In case you've forgotten, Telma's an older woman who's very forward with Link, who in turn steals a few, uh, adult glances at her throughout his adventure. Aonuma's made it no secret that she's his favorite character in the game, and says if there was a bartender like her in real life, he'll definitely go to her bar. He also says he likes the idea of getting scolded by her, but Aonuma isn't the only director that left his mark on Twilight Princess HD. In the original game, there were so many textures on buildings and features that were just slightly too blurry to make out, such as this mural in Hyrule Castle Town. Fans had wondered what the mural was supposed to say, but even extracting the texture from the game's files didn't help anyone decipher it. 
When the HD version released, the textures were updated with clearer, brand new designs, giving fans an impression of what the original textures may have depicted. Interestingly, this particular mural features a Rito, a species which does not exist in the time the game takes place, nor in the series' child timeline. Another improved texture can be found in the Temple of Time, a simple picture frame. But this frame holds a secret, a backwards message written in Hylian along the lower border. Translating it reveals a hidden developer credit. Jack Kirby Crosby made this. Crosby, a graphic designer who worked on the HD version, later confirmed he was responsible for both the hidden border and the mural, the latter of which was a result of a higher-up at Nintendo, asking for some engravings in Hyrule Castle Town to be redone in the same style as a shop Crosby had retextured. The new mural design was inspired by Crosby's own idea of a story for a Zelda game, and drew additional inspiration from a Zelda art book without any story direction from Nintendo, meaning the events depicted therein are non-canon. Did you also know the Zelda team almost made a sequel to Twilight Princess, but Miyamoto had them change course and make Link's crossbow training instead? Or that Tarrytown was initially planned as a customizable village that could be torn down and rearranged? For more facts about Zelda games, click one of the videos on screen. And hey, I'm part of Good Vibes Gaming now! I've got back together with my old crew, and we're gonna make some really fun stuff. My first video has nothing to do with Zelda, unless you really like the claw shots, cause in that case, it's the Spider-Man 3 games, you kind of grapple around, kinda. It's not a great game, but it is very funny. Subscribe for more videos just like this one, and let us know in the comments which games you'd like us to cover in the future. Thanks for watching.